Welcome, everybody, back here to Siegel Talks at the Martin E. Siegel Theater at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. It's a, a beautiful spring day. The, the sun is out, and we see uh, the, the blooms of our trees and, uh, and the kind of, of materialization of nature. And that brings us um, to the topic um, of to do, I think, very closely um, and what it means to us to see that and feel that. We have with us today a German uh, philosopher, Andreas Weber who uh, thought very deeply about the time we live in, this uh, epochal change, this uh, change of paradigms we are in. And um, so welcome, Andreas. Where are you now and what time is it? Thank you, Frank. I'm, uh, yeah, well, that's a good question on this kind of call. I'm um, in my flat in Berlin and it mm. is uh, 6.30 in the evening. So um, it's a bit later, but it's still daylight and I can um i can confirm what you said about the vegetation of the northern hemisphere it looks like every night um there's just it, the green and the flowers double it's it's you know it's amazing these days where where when you think back you you think well somehow spring started and i didn't recognize it was just there so it's just this moment right now yeah amazing um tomorrow's earth day um, this is the third of our talks, which we call uh, Whole Earth Talks, a great title suggested by uh, Thomas Oberander, who also was with us, um, who thought deeply about theater. Andreas is with us because he wrote a book, and I think it's an um, important book that um, uh, asks us to reflect on the new relation we have or should have and will have uh, with the, the sphere we call nature, the uh, way humans interact uh, on the planet with the universe, with the cosmos in a way. And he has an interesting uh, a word uh, which he uses throughout the book. Uh, uh, and it is related to our field. We come from the field of theater and performance. His, a lot of his thoughts circle around the word of enlivenment. And, um, and this is, of course, an important uh, a word, uh, Philip Auslander and Peggy Phelan have worked a lot about the idea of, of the liveness and, and ideology and technology where they come together as an ontology of performance in, uh, in music, uh, performance uh, and uh, music where, you know, bodies, it's something much more than where bodies are in this room, actors and, uh, uh, and uh, audiences. And um, so this, I also feel, is an update on the thinking and really important to us. But first of all, um, Thomas, without thinking and talking about theater and performance, which we might do later, tell us a little bit of the idea of enlivenment, the perspective enlivenment, which you wrote so beautifully and so meaningful about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me to this. Um, yeah, so so basically the word, I think, is more or less um, a creation. It didn't really exist in English language. And it, 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 I have to, to say that it wasn't my creation. It uh, came from a colleague from uh, the German um, Heinrich Böll Foundation, Heike Löschmann. And uh, when while we were thinking about the outcomes of a, a workshop, a day-long workshop I had done um, with actually basically a lot of artists and 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 people somehow in, involved in um, ecological transition, and um, I had a German word for it, and we had a name for the workshop, but we didn't really have an English word for it. And then this somehow popped up. And the the beautiful thing is, it is a, a complement to enlightenment, which you all know. And the idea was that enlightenment actually does what enlightenment somehow had, had omitted, namely to um, account for the, the lived experience in the agents in this world. So enlightenment was about the, the autonomy of the rational actor. And we all know that it was basically the white male rational actor, which, which went central stage. So enlightenment is about the interconnection of the, um, the embodied experiencing, feeling, Intersubject. Let's call it intersubject. So the idea is that that um, what we're missing, and we're still we're missing this even in the in the most advanced discourse. I'd say still, if you look into um, post humanities, for example, or new materialism, what what we're missing is the is the fact that 
being in this world always always means that you're experiencing life from the inside. So we have an experience about this world as being fully alive because we are part of it. And our little a little conversation about the the spring um, plant beings celebrating celebrating with us the return of life um, to life in the northern hemisphere is just an example. You know, we 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 don't slip into this talk on an only abstract way we 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 have the desire to to somehow invite those who literally give life to us and whose presence we experience as life giving into the talk and actually before i end um, with answering your question i want to actually do this i want to invite these plant beings around me the maples and the um variety of shrubs and the grass and the um the early flowers and the what you see me you see me looking around the um colored dove i want them to invite into this talk because they are invited they are already in my life and i really want to invite them to join us to be living together to be alive together yeah, it is um, um, an, a change, a time of a radical change we live in, um, in into the age of the Anthropocene, uh, which um, uh, uh, for everybody who, who has listened to our talks before uh, will know that now the impact of man on planet Earth is irreversible. Something radically has happened and we have to adapt to that. And you are asking that we consider to look at the world from the perspective of an ecosystem, as if we are part of a larger system, a life system, and not just, as you just said, from our um, inner inner side. And um, you say we are in a global crisis in sense making, and mm. um, and uh, we follow an ideology of death from discard, with anything broke down to atoms and to uh, logarithms. Um, um, where does your field, or I don't know if it's your field, the biology come in? Where, what does it have to tell us, what we should be thinking about? Um, well, so it's important to, to see um, when you use the word biology, that the biology I'm bringing. So I'm a biologist. I'm, I'm a graduated biologist. That's, that was my first, um, that my, my first um, education. And then I also did a PhD in philosophy. But I'm a biologist, and in many respects, I'm, 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 I also am thinking bio, bio, in a biological way. So I, I, this does, didn't leave me. So it's important to see, nevertheless, that the biology I've been trained in um, is um, not, the, not of the mainstream kind in a way. So it's a, it's a way um, what I've been doing, and I've been doing this with my dear teacher, Francisco Varela, in Paris in, in the late 1990s, was to understand um living beings not as machines but as self-creating subjects so this is a very different biology from the biology you can you can see everywhere and you'll get to learn when you start when you're so bold to do um undergraduate training in biology then you'll learn all these deterministic um algorithmic machine-like um, ideas but what we have been trying to do um is to um to prove in a way that that what cells the building blocks of organisms are actually about is to continuously build up themselves so they're not machines they are somehow processes of desire wanting to be a body let's let's put it like this in a little in a bit approximative way so um living beings from this idea of biology and you can i mean i've done this in several books and and which which draw on the work of my teacher varela he's done this in admirable work and and he's he's um as we know he's very known for this um so you you can show that if you slightly twist your perspective um you can from a, from a very grounded biological way argue for the for the idea that living beings are um are those embodied processes, processes of the flesh, which work from an inner center of desire to um, 
to give existence, to, to create existence. And I think that's, that's absolutely amazing because it is completely different from the story of mainstream biology. Although it works with the same empirical observations, it doesn't introduce anything from the outside, anything new. Um, but it dovetails with our own experience. So far, in, in, you see, in, in, if, you, if you turn it around like this and you see like living beings are obviously, they are subjects, wow. Every living being is a subject. So then it is no problem to understand our own experience of being subjects, which we have. I mean, that's our, that's our inner experience. It's, it's the experience of being feeling, desiring, vulnerable, um, elastic, powerful subject. That's our feeling. And um, in this kind of biology, this goes back, this, there's no gap anymore. You know, the, the dualistic gap, which somehow was always between the, 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 the only subjectivity we could think of, namely human subjectivity, and the rest of the world as machine. This goes away if you look at biology from, from, from that perspective. And, um, and I think this is such an amazing gift of this um, perspective um, because then we are, we are connect back, connected back to the world at a moment when we are in deadly separation, <laughs> oh, <laughs> when separation yeah. is really hurting. Yeah, so, so that, a little bit like this. Yeah, yeah. and this is you know, um, um, part of the crisis that we actually do not see, as uh, you quoted, the, the web of life, uh, the flesh of the world, Melo Ponty, you, you, you quoted, um, mm. that we do not understand that we are part of uh, something uh, much uh, uh, larger and that we are as a life, as the universe we observe. I like, and let's maybe go to it a little bit for also for mm. our listeners, the idea of the aliveness, what you say, or the enlivenment, you say, is a, is a notion of artistic expression, artistic mm. work, artistic research. Mm. You say that experience of this artistic uh, context, what artists do is like the ecosystem itself. It works with imagination. That's, that's an incredible statement. Your book is so full of ideas, but let me, let me re re say it again. So you, if I understood it right, artistic work reflects or is life itself. It is uh, uh, um, a force, part of the real force of imagination, of the force of life, life of nature, of biology. Do, did I understand that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's you understand it. I know that you understand it because because this otherwise you wouldn't single it out here by quoting it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I try to I try to. So that's very important, and I, that's actually really part of my still very much part of my actual work um, to understand this because. I mean, let me build a bridge from what I said before to this. Let me let me think how to do it because um, um, in we 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 all know all those. I mean, everyone because everyone does it, and all those who who, who are connected with arts or producing of art, but actually everyone is connected to this because we all bring forth newness or bring forth something which touches about touches on meaning. We know that in, in doing this, there is some mysterious center which is very closely connected to the experience of being very much alive. So there is a, there is an, a, a, a very important contact between the experience of being alive and the experience we, we receive through, um, through poetic creation or through the arts, through artworks. And this always has been um, a, a huge um, topic of interest for myself. And, um, and it's even the reason why I've started to um, call yet another book, a poetics of biology, biopoetics. It's called biopoetics. So, it's, so, so pursuing the idea that actually there's only one poetics, there's only one process of expressiveness, expressiveness of life and that it was wrong from the from the beginning to separate the, the the way human artists create art from the way life itself creates um, meaningfulness, creates expression, creates um, the experience of what is actually in its center. So that, so this is this is this is my 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 research in in pulling these things together. I still do it. I have a I have a paper 
waiting for review, um, which is about about just this. So it's it's I think it is this is this is it's really the the sort of umbilical cord, and um, and this is why art is so important in this dire time we're in because because we in through art our civilization which has more or less completely given up the the conviction that we can be connected to aliveness uh, through art we can still do this it's not easy because there are many um different opinions about art as you know it's not easy um but it's i think in in the in the original experience of being truly touched by something it's there it's there this it's life it's life it's life which touches you and then then we have it again okay mm -hmm. yeah so 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 far maybe at the moment yeah i think this is a, a, a quite significant uh, in general but especially of course for 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 students of art of theater uh, practitioners um to understand your notion that uh, an artistic expression artistic work actually is nature in itself and in a way the highest form in a say you say of mm -hmm. nature you quote playwrights which is mm -hmm. very interesting you have Václav uh, Havel but also the romanticists like Schiller and you who you say um, um, not who was not following Hegel or Marx and Engels in kind of an utopian uh, uh, idea of a paradise on earth but uh, said we have to find a way to live in contradictions uh, in uh, opposed uh, opposites uh, and um, and that playfulness, the idea of play, and you quote that, which I didn't know that Schiller went back as what he did as a child, that in the idea of playing, you reach a highest, a high form of being alive or being part of nature, as you would say, in being creative with imagination. Tell, tell, us, tell me a bit of how come we have you quote a playwrights in your work as a biologist oh, and a philosopher. Um, lovely, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that's a, it's so that's such a lovely path you're 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 beating there to 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 get at the 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 the, the topic at, at let's say at the 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 field we we are having this talk in. So um, play is also very important. Um, I mean, play in the sense of playing, like children play or we play or, or all animals play. By the way, all animals play. I say this for the audience. So even the, the tiniest animals play, ants play, individual ants play in different styles. So, so playing is um, is very important as uh, uh, as something in which we um, emulate the freedom of of life, which creates itself or which gives away itself. And in playing, we also connect to this center. So if everybody knows this, and if even though some might need to think back to their childhood, everyone knows that in play, now I'm, I'm still talking about children's play in a way, like, like free play. In this play, we are, if we're really in it, then we're in, in, contact, in contact with something very beautiful and something very powerful. So again, we're, con we're in contact with, very much we're in contact with life. We're also in contact with our needs. So this is why, uh, Joseph Campbell said to do everything what you do as play because then you'll be in contact with your needs. So now coming to Schiller, Schiller, so this the German playwright and philosopher, um, contemporary of Goethe, good friend of Goethe, he um, has written this, these letters about aesthetic education, yeah, who probably, I don't know how known they are in, in English, in the English literature world now today. But they are actually about playing, and he was a playwright, so he knew something about playing, <laughs> playing on stage, and um, and for him in play, um, you could you could you could act according to um, very severe rules in a completely free way, free way. So that that was the that was the magic. You do something which follows a a, a, a very hard necessity. So. So my story is that the, the rules are those, but you do it in the, in, the, in the most possible freedom. And for him, this was beauty. For Schiller, this is beauty. And, and I mean, this is interesting in so many respects. So it's interesting first to look at the setting. So because we know we're never free, but we're always free to choose. So we're never free. I'm, I have my body, I have my character, whatever. I have all these things. 
I cannot, I can never change, not, not really, not, not fundamentally, but I'm free to choose how to play with them. And, um, and so that, that, is, that is one important point. And, and another important point is that um, beauty is not something um, which is clean. Um, to the contrary, it comes out of attention, but it is still possible if we are able to enliven this tension, if we, if we lead it back to life. Yeah, so in a way, um, it became very natural for me. And I think it's Schiller in this is still somehow, um, it needs, he needs to be reread. And um, I, I actually, you, you haven't found that in that book, um, but I also, I've also learned a lot from another um, author and philosopher who was also a playwright, not only a playwright, Cam Albert Camus, the French, mm -hmm. but he was a playwright and he was an actor also. He acted, he, he was, he was um, acting his, playing in his own um, uh, theater at the beginning, at least. And um, in his, I can also only recommend that in this famous book, The Rebel from the 1950s, he is very close to, to what you quoted from Schiller. He's very close. He wants to find a way. It's a, it's a political book, act, book actually, but it, it, it culminates in a, in a poetics. So he wants to find a way between um, resignation and becoming violent because you want to achieve something. And he found this, this third way in, um, in creation, in creating art, because then you, you don't have to cut through the contradictions, but you can play with them. You can create something new on the ground of contradictions. And that is what, what humans, and not only humans, beings probably, immediately recognize as beauty. So, I mean, recognizing it beauty means that it fills them with a sort of bliss. It's a, it's a, it's a birth, it's a big new beginning. So yeah, that's, they, they, they are very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, um, you you are asking also science uh, what I think theater people you know think they do. But you know, how do we feel? You know, how do we experience history? How do we experience science? How do we experience nature? You know, and to refocus on that that we are not separated. And you say we are part of that web of that structure. Um, mm. If we look on stages, most of it often is a reflection of an inner self. I think there are monologues, you know, mm. monodramas, uh, uh, human conflicts on stage. Um, but you quote, as so many also on our talks, uh, um, that new uh, uh, um, epoch of the Anthropocene that has uh, arrived. So Holocene, you know, when 15,000 years ago, farmers started, you know, slowly, you know, creating... A, a living, a better living um, um, through observation of nature and creating tools and ultimately science. Um, uh, now we have changed the world and the world has changed, whether we like it or not. Uh, it is like the time of Galileo when Galileo said the earth actually turns around the sun and the other said, no, it's not. It's wrong. You're not right. And we are in the same moment uh, of serious um, um, of change. It already has happened. It is denied by many. But how can theater, what do you mm -hmm. think, or art, what can art do that you change from that inner perspective to mm -hmm. what you say, the perspective of considering the world uh, uh, as an ecosystem, or you, you focus, uh, you quote David Blumen, the implicit order of the cosmos, mm. indigenous thinking, uh, you also uh, quote, that we are part of something bigger. How, what, what are ideas you have that theater can do, should do, what you saw, what you think or what you dream about? Okay, yeah, there, there was a lot in this question. Very interesting, lovely. So let me, um, let me, um, where do, where do I start? So I start some, somehow I start at the end of what you said, but then I'll, I'll jump back to the beginnings. So, so when you say I, I see the world, the world as an ecosystem, um, I'd, I'd really say it much much more strongly. So this is still somehow um, very, very mainstream in a way. So I do see the world as an ecosystem, but I, what, what I want to stress is that this ecosystem is is experiencing itself through the interactions. Um, or you could you could actually say, and then I'll explain this through the end actions um, between 
all its members. So this ecosystem is not just a system, it is actually um, a shared living process of co-creation of living newness. So this is different. It is different. It is not a system. It is not abstract. It is, it is lived. And while we're talking about it, we do, we're making it. We're doing it right now, right here. We're creating the ecosystem. Not only by talking about it, but also, for example, my, my, my famous example, by because I breathe and with, ev with every out breath, I'll f I feed the trees in front of my window. So you see this and who also desire for life. So this is, it's very, it's very embodied. It's very embodied. And um, so that's, that's something, but I, I come back to this. I, I wanted to, to do a little comment on, on this quick sequence you, you drew from early days of humanity to today when you said the farmers and then gave us a better living. It's very important to see that it, the, the transition from into agriculture wasn't for a better living. It was for some, um, some warlords, some early warlords who wanted to enslave people. And um, it was easier when you had a huge production of grains to enslave people. So it, 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 it wasn't a it wasn't transi transition into something which inevitably led to progress. It was maybe even a step back, and we're still stepping, <laughs> stepping back. But that's another. It's another story. It's another discussion. So I, I wanted to come back to the word I used when I said um, the all the beings which are the ecosystem enact life together. So there's a word I use: enact, like you enact on a stage. And this is a word which is which comes from the research of my teacher Francisco Varela, who actually coined um, a, a coined a, a direction of cognitive sciences, um, inactivism. So they're still called inactivism, and that means that um, that people who who adhere to this or subscribe to this, they know that there is nothing preformed and fixed. But there is always a relational exchange in everything which enacts the diverse desires of the agents which are implied in this process in a free and expressive and imaginative way. So you see, this, this brings non-mainstream non, um, biology, let's say, say non-dualistic biology, this brings non-dualistic biology very close to what you're doing in theater, you see. So actually life is something which is continuously enacted. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? And um, it is enacted because you're never alone. And um, there, there is no reality which is just there. So you have to create your own reality um, together with those who also create the, who also need to live and create this reality together with you. So everything is always enacted. So there's not, not, there's nothing firm in a way. And it is enacted through a shared desire of, of remaining in this living process, of, of, of adding to living, this living process. And, um, and it's very much improvised. So actually, if I, in doing my, my little preparatory thinking for this talk, I was thinking actually, um, theater is a very profound way of showing life because it is very much in, in a performative manner, it is very much that which happens in life. So you see, you have these, you have actually a double storyline in theater. You have the, the storyline, which is the storyline, and then you have the living beings um, playing improvisation uh, in enacting the storyline. And so that's another storyline. So you profoundly understand something about life. And I think, just linking back to Schiller, I think he, he knew this all, already then. So he wanted to, to underline that there is a, there is, there is a second storyline in this. And um, if, I, if I can go on for one or two minutes, I don't know sure. if it's too long. I have, I have, no, I have found it. Something, I found something else which is very interesting. So I, I might even, I might come back to an action because it, it might be, I, I pull this directly from cognitive sciences into this audience. So may, that might be a little bit too much, but I find it just too beautiful that they use this term, you know, they use this term and they, they explain this term. So, so sense is created by improvising in, in this interest of, 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 of creating a coherent togetherness. I mean, doesn't that sound like stage? I think very much it sounds like stage. So, so now I want to just to um, hint 
um, at another German um, philosopher and writer um, who happens to be Friedrich Nietzsche. And I just want to uh, shed the light on his early work, which then he, he somehow retracted and he hated that he had written it, The Birth of the Tragedy, where he was talking about the, the chorus in the, in, in the Greek tragedy. And he has some very interesting ideas about the chorus. So let's drop all this Richard Wagner stuff and all these things, all, the, all this, just, just this, just this idea, because he says the chorus of the G Greek tragedy is, is sort of that which, which links the tragedy to the ancient, archaic, we could even say animistic or shamanistic times in, in, in ancient Greek before the classics. And for him, and he, he's, he writes this, I quote, um, for him, the chorus is full of natural beings. He says natural beings. So he's, he uses, he says satires. But I mean, you know, natural beings are actually natural beings, <laughs> like um, maple trees and um, wood pigeons. So it is actually life itself speaking in the chorus. And, and for him, this was, this was this crazily important reference point for, for suggesting um, this, the, the Dionysian dimension of art, which connects to this, um, to this reservoir of aliveness we, we, and um, which goes back to to an ancient time in which Dionysus wasn't it was was somehow a vege vegetative god bringing life so going very far back so so you see again there is a and when I understood this I, I, I was thinking well there's a there's a profound link um, in this idea again between theater and um and an animistic understanding that what is actually happening in theater is life itself. We see life itself happening. So to conclude, because I think you asked what can, what can theater contribute <laughs> to the transition? So I would say make clear that we see life happening and let life happen in a way that it is um, truly really happening. So even happening for the spectators who then don't remain spectators. If you're a spectator, it's always, you're always in, already in a dualistic setting, you know, you, you know this. And, and this is why so many um, theater authors somehow try to break this dualistic setting in a way. So like the Brecht making it even more dualistic just to show you, look, this is a dualistic illusion or others um, pulling the, 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 the audience in. But um, if you, if you understand that that was what is happening in front of your eyes is a uh, is life creating itself in this moment, then you are much more in a in a um, in a, in a setting in a setting of how could we call it of of ecstasy maybe of ritual in which you somehow become part of as even as the audience of life recreating itself. So I would think into this direction, but then I'm a philosopher and I'm not a theater <laughs> author. <laughs> So, you know, philosophers always give bad recipes when artists ask, so what, what should we do? They never ask a philosopher, let, let, let an art, artist do. Um, and I think I see it some, at some places, I also see it already done. But I, I mean, I, to me, the reservoir of, of theater is, is enormous, actually, in, 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 in molding this post-dualistic way of contact with life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow, I think this is, it is quite a big and significant, I think, um, recognition, you know, of um, a theater, as you say, is actually the force of life or representing life itself, completely independent what is being shown or represented, um, that yeah. the, the, the laws or the, the limitations yeah. or the creative process, the, uh, the uh, commitments, the agreements, when to do what, represent for that moment, actually, if I understand right, life in itself in its highest uh, form and doing theater and which is so true is you know that the feeling of a life that's why actors like it to view it to be part of it like in a way sometimes like sports um, but much more uh, interesting than it's not just a winner or a loser you know even so if it's a great game but you can see the contradictions you talk a lot about it that uh, life is is cruel is full of contradictions it's a uh, messy it's a catastrophe you could uh, and that um 
actually, I think that is also important that uh, theater actually represents life how it really is. We do not see uh, these uh, lies of uh, happiness and happy endings. We do uh, the, the deceptions, the murders, the betrayals, but then also real love and the disasters, what everybody knows what will happen and it happens um, anyway. So I think um, this is quite a, a significant uh, uh, um, observation towards our field coming out of biology and philosophy of contemporary one that asks us radically, if I stand right, to rethink what we are doing and maybe go a little bit more um, into that, that idea, uh, what you talk about that, uh, we have to change our point of view. You have, we have to include uh, th th ways of thinking that we haven't thought before. What do you think are the most important things to keep in mind for a young theater artist that someone 50 mm -hmm. years ago didn't have to worry about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I'm, I, I'm, I, I feel very much like a dilettante when you ask me in, in these concrete ways, but I will still, I will still venture bravely into it. And um, so, so I think actually what what I already said, what is um, what is most important um, is to recontact, find a contact, find a new contact, reconnect with this, with this, the the the, the inner experience of 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 aliveness, which isn't, um, which isn't a category. It's not a category in theater only for the for the actors. So they have to do this because they, they, otherwise they couldn't act, you know. But it's not a it's not a category really. It's very much. Actual theater is very much about um, paying tribute to many important things in, in, let's say, in the in the history of art, in the history of theater, in the in the, in the actual world of of of, of um, which needs to be related. But but the going into the onto the the let's say somehow into the experiential side, into the inward side, into the side which from from a hidden position um can make contact with others um is 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 isn't um isn't really trained it's not it's trained trained nowhere i i explain with it maybe with an example which i know a bit better which is a philosophical conference um so we have a philosophical conference about new thoughts about life it's just a fictional philosophical conference and how will this work? There will be speakers and they will present their ideas and then there will be discussion and there might be some workshops afterwards. And then people will go away. They have exchanged their new ideas about life. And I, I've participated in some of these conferences, as you can imagine, and they're always highly frustrating for everyone because they don't lead anywhere. And um, I remember I was once in a very interesting conference actually about the commons, so about the idea that that actually we we create everything always only by sharing it. And um, there were really great people, great great people who had great done great work work. And we were there for two days, sitting in a room, and quarreling, <laughs> quarreling about judge men mental judgments, and then. There was one afternoon there there were these breakout groups who could do anything and i i um I had one of these groups I facilitated one of these groups or I volunteered to do it and then we walked to the river there was a river actually we realized okay wow well, there's a river behind there a beautiful river beautiful German river between hills and we went to the river for the first time and it, I asked the river for participation I asked the river to to be generous with us to 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 invite us in and um and it became such a beautiful incredibly rich connection with such a lot of insights and outcomes in these two hours at the river and we hadn't do, done anything we didn't even really discuss but it was it was really there were so many insights we only we so we so you see we somehow went over to this other side of saying okay we are all part of this interconnected breathing flesh and let's first establish this connection among all of this interconnected breathing flesh and then let's see what comes from this I, I, you see this is what i suggest and then explore this um and and i know from my own experiences that 
in the, in the art world, as in philosophy, which is of, often very conceptual, it is very difficult to do it. Although on stage, and that's your, your great advantage, working with actors or with dancers, it's the same thing. On stage, you, you have this because actors need to be acutely emotionally aware of something which is actually not really visible, but which is still there. So you actually have already the, the tools or the, the raw substance and, and, um, and then work with this, but work with this in a way that the public is really drawn into that. That's 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 what I what I think the, is the most important thing is to 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 to, re, to to find again that we can be touched um, by by existing together on this planet. We can be touched at a very very profound place in in deep in ourselves in the in the center of our heart, the heart of our hearts, and. Um, and to my experience, if this happens, everything changes. Although we haven't changed anything um, on the program, although we haven't we haven't invited in, invented any um, particularly new concepts, and um, but people change, and and some some somehow suddenly things make sense sense b b which before seemed void and seemed um, meaningless, and. Um, I invoke Nietzsche in a way with this idea that actually the, the chorus is a remnant from shamanistic traditions. And I would just want to, to say that we, we still live in a world where there are these animistic traditions with, which, are, which are very theat theatrical in traditional cultures. And um, so we still have, let's say, the, um, the, the raw power of theater enacted in cultures throughout the world, which we, we can walk there, we can look at it, we, we can ask, we can ask if we, if we can look at it, if we can ask. And, um, and, and all those cultures, the people in those cultures, they work so much with this, with this invisible connections and creating power from this invisible connections, which I think um, is a sort of, well, it's, it's arts magic. Let's, let's, call, it, let's call, it, call it arts magic. Um, um, Rosie Bridotti, um, with with no resp respect whatsoever, uses the word magic. So I also will will use the word magic here. <laughs> mm -hmm. It has been well, well introduced. So so be because there has been so much fear um, about this, about using this the magic of connection, and, and we had to be clean and rational, and we had to be non non sentimental and not romantic. You see, these are all qualities of the machine. These are all qualities of of disconnections, and um, and in in many respects, art in in um, in our age, art since the, the the revolution of modernism has somehow misunderstood um, the the its own potential and has has shied away from using this elemental magic of working for life, and and but I think it can it can and it does. And um, and it's fun. It's joy. I mean, it's joy. Like you say, it's joy. It's deep suffering, but it's all there. It's real. It's real. It's life. Life in in a raw state, which then becomes very, very much, very powerful. And I think this is this is what what can be done. I think what, what will be done. What mm -hmm. to me sounds interesting. No, this is that this is important, and I'm still thinking. Would you say this um, reminder? Um, what we learned from our master, the Schechners and Turner and Kortowski, and so many that a ritual, uh, in a way, you know, is the base of what we need to. And uh, it is not the highly commercial theaters, you know, where um, the most mm -hmm. uh, lowest common denominator, you know, brings us together, but to really um, honor and that deep mystical collect connection of being alive. I mean, one of the incredible things is that Galileo, who taught us, you know, that we are actually going around the sun, looked at the stars. Now we look back with our telescopes flying through the sky and we cannot find anything that is like mm. Earth. There's nothing mm. found mm. in mm. light years. As far as we know, there will there are other places. I do also believe that, but it hasn't been found. And so this yeah. what makes then life, life, the magic of it, the art, and that art resistance, it is something that we should honor <clears throat> and um, take serious, that we are transformed by it. And the big idea also of nature 
um, I think is, you know, that we that we are transformed by um, what we are doing and to be alive, to be living means transformation, what we also Absolutely. actually see yeah. on stage. You touched on commons and you also write about it. Um, yeah. I don't want to talk too long, but I, I like that very much. You, I think you quoted David Bellieu, Bellieu, if I quoted right. Who said, Bollier, Bollier. Yeah, yeah Bollier. public spaces, gardens, uh, uh, parks, yeah. farmers markets, festivals outside are significant to mental health, to local health, to economy. And we need to invite that in, in our lives, in our work, the exchange of the plentitude and um, and you say that a beautiful sentence, see, corporations cannot provide that. They will not provide that. They have no interest, but art can. The idea of the commons, um, um, what are you finding out about the commons and how is it connected to, to nature or your, your idea of biology? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great, um, it's a great hit. I can, I can hit back over the net. Um, so actually, um, so commons, commons are um, relational processes in which, um, in which, in who, in where the participants are humans and other than human beings and um, beings like water and the atmosphere and forests and all this. So they are actually um, embodied relationships which create aliveness. And um, in 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 the ancient times where there were only cultures um, which worked in the traditional way like traditional animistic cultures today everything was a commons actually everything the whole world was understood as a commons and and we, we also call this sharing economy so there was no capitalistic production although you might find in, in the books that the first um, human immediately started to barter <laughs> with with the second human but that's that's just wrong it's just a, a rewriting of history from the perspective of a perspective of a capitalist so so actually in a way um our life which is a life and you said that very beautifully of of, of uh, a life in relationships which are mutual transformations is always a life in commons it is a commons and my finding um was and and when i when i somehow when it occurred i was like oh wow this is this is really this is why 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 did i overlook this so much actually nature itself is a commons so nature is a is a embodied system of relationships which only works because everything can be shared and everything is shared and is then mutually recreated and this is this is what we see now in spring this is the the commons having its its most creational phase so nature itself is a commons and then it is very much clear that it must be fun to participate in the commons because if we are from the made of the stuff of life then it is always fun to to do what life likes to do so being part of a commons and unfortunately the the philosophy dominating our western the western world view, the global western worldview is the contrary to the commons so capitalism is is just it's, it's just the opposite of commons it's like um every, what 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 is there with which without an owner obviously is free to take and let's put a price tag on it and let's outmaneuver the others so it's not at all about sharing and we know i mean at least i, I think we i think we know I, I know that this is destroying life this is destroying the planet this is destroying life so it it is very important um to remember the commons and and then we can link this again directly to art because doing art is always also a practice of the commons so so it, culture is a commons because culture is about um creating meanings through relationships and we don't really see this we we, we know that that there's a lot of money involved and it is functioning according to our systems but it's actually um, art is like life, a commons, and um, and a commons is something which becomes more when you share it. And you know that art becomes more when you share it. I mean, that is just that is even the most fundamental aspect of art is that you share it, and then you give this gift to others who who are um, set in in a light and who also want to create art. I mean, I, I 
every artist is somehow has somehow been transmitted this spark by um, another artist who he found or he read and he just fell in love with this idea, with this idea that that he or she or they could also give this gift so you see this is a commons it's about giving and art is about giving and life is about giving and um and it, i think it is so important to see this because it's so important that we have an alternative to this deadly machine which still wants to to convince us that we have to adapt and that we have to 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 align with this deadly machine in order to somehow survive on this planet so you see that's another it's a, it's on a on a little bit more abstract level um but um but that's another um the dimension in which art can put itself in service of life and i think again again actually um theater as this somehow archaic and ancient form of meeting of meeting in a in a, in a village square <laughs> which is the stage and and commoning together about life um is a place where where this can be done and i mean just you know the situation there's that there's a, there's there there are the spectators who want to let's say the participants let's call them the participants and then there are the, the more active participants which formerly were called actors and and they want to and they want to make make a particular story palpable and transmit it which is the the story um the narrative or whatever whatever it is of the of the piece the, you, you see i have difficulty to retranslate my commons version of the theater into the modern um terminology and um so this story needs to be made alive through participation that's commoning it's commoning so narrative is commoning oral culture is commoning and um you see there's so there's so much convergence and i think um i think there there's so much to be found and i think that creators will find this so i i can't i can't suggest so that we do, should do this and do this. This is just, I, I might do it, be able to do it if I really tried, but then in a very concrete way. But, but um, there's so much richness, only that this richness has been buried by um, certain, um, by, by certain, let's say, intellectual morals who, 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 were, who were very much about um, separation and about, um, thinking that um we 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 cannot really be in connection we cannot really be in touch but this is this is over this thinking is over we we know we can and we know we must also incredible yeah and and um and it, i i i like that very much that part of that how you call it the new green deal or the new materialism that you see an exchange of gift is part of that kind of new ecological existence and um, and art making is gift you know, also, as you say, the flowers that are coming out on the tree, I mean, they are in a way, um, we are not charged for it, it works. Um, yeah, yeah, there's no copyright, copyright. there's no copyright yes. in nature also, you said, uh, uh, very interestingly. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that, you know, the idea of the gift instead of the machine and the copyright and the, uh, and, uh, and, uh, the, the capitalist uh, model and that art, has to stand for that as a real representation, as you say, of nature and to be part of it, to experience it, to be part of it, and actually to be life, performing life, completely mm. independent. It's interesting, the great Gertrude Stein always said, half of theater has nothing to do what you show. The idea is people come together for that evening. They call their friends, they get dressed, go to eat, and before. That is a significant a uh, 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 reason to do theater independent from the great content but you also say we need to participate because that's when we are alive we see life it's very act of creation is a uh, nature is that kind of biology in in uh, in process and it uh, uh, makes us alive it's like live music and not uh, like something from a can um, I would like to ask you about the idea you speak about freedom or the total freedom of nature and creativity in it. Tell a little bit about that idea, um, um, the maximal, maximum of freedom that you think exists within nature and how it trends, how it connects to art. Yeah, so so first let me thank you for this little nice little phrase when you said it is it is 
um, um, we need to be live on theater. We need to be live. I think this is this is really that. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really you see, and then you, you you shifted it. It is not about having something. It is really about being something. Being, it is about yeah. being live. And this being, you can never do this alone. You always do this in togetherness. So you you immediately somehow draw in the other, and you need to think, how can I do this in order that this really is live? So so that's I think this is very beautiful. And um, I, I built my way to to your question. The second the second um, remark is, um, I, I feel it important to to tell this to to the audience, particularly that I really try not to, I personally try not to use the word nature anymore because nature is always mm -hmm. a thing. Nature is, it's, this is this is why the, the philosophers have, have suffered for decades because they wanted to somehow understand how nature is actually different from us. But, but nature is, from the get-go, if you use this term, then it is already a thing. It's and, not um, us, yeah. Not us. It's an object. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a thing which stands below us. So we are, we are actually suffering narcissists standing above this thing, and we can't connect it to to it. And it is actually, and it is, it doesn't make any sense philosophically because where where do you 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 never find this border, you know? You because you know your body is nature because it is evolved from nature. So 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 actually, it's better to drop it and to to, okay. to speak about something. I mean, you you do as you want, so don't mm -hmm. see it no, as a, a good as an, as an admonition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just see it as a, as a, as, a, as a contribution to this to this discourse. Because the interesting thing is that when we stop using nature, then we need to um, address the, the 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 players because we don't have any word for it. Um, so we could say life, and that sounds already very much better because then we are always already in it. So we, we already, we mm -hmm. know, we can't say we are out of life. That that's, doesn't make sense. I'm not part of life. That doesn't make sense. Or you talk about, you talk about the specific beings um, and, and, and then you have them, then you need to somehow invite them into the com communication, which I also like. So, so please take it, not take it, don't yeah, take no, it as a correct, it's, it's take it as very good. I, 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 I think it is very important to, to 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 see. It is not it is not easy to do it. I've written nature so many times in all my books because they are all about nature. But I try in my later writing. I really try to experiment with avoiding this. And um, okay, so freedom. Freedom is a, is as you know a very very loaded word, and um, and it it can take two directions it can take the direction of of um legitimizing um the, the brutal acts of defending your ego and this is what it direction it has taken in in free as in capitalism <laughs> free world and all this but it can also be about the it can also be about gift that that is the other direction of freedom. So it can be about um, the that which is given, which has hasn't any precondition. That is that is an interesting freedom. So it hasn't it isn't the gift of life is free in the sense that it hasn't any precondition. It is not given um, in terms of reacting to anything transactional so it is not given back it is always freely given the act of creation hasn't any precondition it comes from the desire to give life to 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 bring something into life and um and in in this respect it is the most um, intense uh, core of of giving or re receiving the gift and and again i think in cre in, in creating art if I can put it this this vaguely, we are we are somehow acting from the inside of this um, of this total freedom of of desiring to give, which is such a beautiful thing to do. And we know we know that this freedom um, is so beautiful when we can follow it, when we when we really um, and a can enable ourselves to to um, let this pass through ourselves and be somehow creative of life and um we, we know that in the in our classical mainstream biology this freedom has been very much reduced so this has this has been present before um biology subscribed to a, a very simplified um 
well, let's let me say it's not biology because there are there there are, there are discussions and it's it's not simplified. But let's say the 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 the, the, the cultural opinion about biology um, became very much this survival of the fittest idea, which we still have. It's it's a bit bit more different today, but it's still the idea that efficiency wins and then freedom goes away because everything which we see um, is not freedom. Um, allegedly, but is the the pressure of competitive forces and scarcities, and et cetera. So it's a product of the market, <laughs> you see, and um, and then freedom is is gone. And and in in a mirroring movement, because this is a very profound metaphor for our existence. And even if we don't use it in in our everyday thinking all the time, it, is, it has profoundly colored the way we humans look on the world. So it has also profoundly colored art. And then this freedom I was talking about, the, the, the freedom of, um, of, of receiving an, an, a gift for which there is no precondition, goes away. This goes away. This, this vanishes from the world. And this is the most horrible thing that can happen. And I think actually it destroys art because art is built on just that. And um, if you stop this process, then you, you'll somehow destroy the possibility of creating art that can pass the gift of life and that's that's just at the same level on the same level like uh, as the the destruction of species is so this is because this is it it somehow empties it dries the sources of life and that that's the most horrible thing that can happen and um so 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 this you see how how bleak the situation is actually what 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 has happened here with this idea that there is actually there is no unconditional freedom of giving the gift of life. Um, but I think it is really wrong. And it's even wrong on the, on the biological level. You can't, you can't, it's, I mean, I, I won't go into details here, but it's the, the narrative of this efficiency game is, is just, it's a classical product, a classical projection of um cultural discourse on on the matter of the world we just we don't realize it and we're so conditioned by it and um and i really recommend to everyone to tentatively in a playful way to to start again to see this freedom and like you beautifully said and with a certain shimmer in your eyes, you know, when you said, "Yeah, true, actually, the flowers I received—that's that's actually I'm I, I just I'm just struck by this." Um, and everyone is different, and I mean, you have the same species, but still, every flower, every blossom is different, and every petal is different, and and the choice of the bumblebee of the first nectar, of the first blossom, which from which she can drink the first nectar, is free, and um, all this. I really invite um, everyone into just trying this because life becomes so much more meaningful. It's so incredibly then then suddenly we we step over into the world into a world in which um, in which our existence is unconditionally given. I mean, that's what a relief. <laughs> what an incredible relief in this world. Um, and and yeah, it's every one of us eight millions is suffering from this idea that nothing is free you know nothing 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 is free <laughs> nothing mm -hmm. is free as in beer every you you have to pay for everything and then this idea that that in truth we might live in a world in which actually life is given freely is distributed freely and with with free and free creativity, like the, the act of giving this is is absolutely unconditional. I mean, it's we we we, we don't know it, it will just happen to us, and it's such a different world, and it, it's really worthwhile to my eyes to, to 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 check this out. I mean, I have fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm but trying in the it. restrictions of our daily existence to find that freedom um, of the giving, receiving, and giving. Yeah. 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 And you yeah, quote I mean, artists as, you know, um, as gift givers, you know, in, in nature, which yeah. is, you know, uh, based on ecological existence is based on giving. Those, it's a fascinating, fantastic, the great 
a manifesto from Peter Schumann from the Red and Puppet Theater comes to my mind. You know, art is cheap, you know, uh, participate, share is a fantastic thing he wrote in the 60s or 70s. Um, mm -hmm. We're coming mm -hmm. um, slowly towards the end, but I just wanted to go to one or two of your comments. You said, think like a mountain. Uh, you quote mm -hmm. someone, so I like that yeah. sentence. Um, it stuck with me, um, maybe on getting out of it. You know, how, how do we think like a mountain and why is it important? Yeah, so that's Aldo Leopold, the, the American um, um, pioneer of nature writing and of, of, na of, eco of, of, of ecological ethics. So maybe not of nature, but, but, but of ecological ethics. So he was, a, he was a forester and he wrote this beautiful little book, Sand County Almanac. And, and, and some more stuff. And he, his idea was that we need to, in order to be ecologically viable, we need to think like a mountain. So it's interesting. So what, what actually, when, when, you, when I hear, heard this sentence first, uh, I was very young. So in, in the beginning of my undergraduate studies or my reading um, accompanying my desperate undergraduate studies in biology, maybe. And I was thinking, what actually does he mean thinking like a mountain? So I think that's the first question. What is this thinking like a mountain? And then again, when you're, when you're walking up a mountain or one peak in a ridge, then you slowly start to understand what he might have meant. So, so, so be, let's let's say in order to understand what what thinking like a mountain could be, you really need to go to the mountain and you really need to climb it in a way to to walk upwards and to encounter all the life which is the mountain. So I would say thinking like a mountain is um, thinking not in human thoughts and not with human words, but um, in beings, in relationships, in, in the process of giving life itself. So in, in a very embodied and enfleshed way of thinking and in a very slow kind of thinking um, and in a very circle, circular and cyclical way of thinking, which over the years and the decades and the centuries and the millennia, because mountains are very long lived, becomes deeper and deeper and deeper. And one way to call this deepness is biodiversity. And another way to call this deepness is beauty. And another way to call this deepness is the multitude of individual experiences which raise up and then dissolve in this mountain again. So this, this, all this is thinking like a mountain. And I think it's a very beautiful way to avoid the word sustainability <laughs> because it's, that's not a great word. And we know this because it's in all um, corporate reports nowadays and, and uh, even the, the most dirty, um, most CO2 creating corporation has a sustainability chapter in, in their report. So it doesn't work. And it comes from capitalism. It comes from forestry management in, in post-Baroque Germany. So that's I think that's what Elder Leopold meant. And, and the great thing is, you know, when you climb the mountain, or you walk the mountain, let's take a, one of these less, less, less not, a, not the Mount Everest, but something a little bit um, raising from a, with some forest and some trees and some wild waters. When you go there, you're also part of the mountain. You know, you, you're, you're a thought in the thinking of the mountain. And I, isn't that beautiful? You're a thought in the, in the thinking of the mountain when you go there. And when you go there and you go there carefully and you ask for permission and you, you're nourishing to, the, to life around you, then you're a beautiful thought. And if you go there with, your, <coughs> with, with the intention of building this great shortcut um, of the road missing to the other side, <laughs> and you're slightly more destructive, and a little bit more pathological in, in way of thinking, you see. So I think it's what I'm doing is is just so somehow extrapolating from from Aldo Leopold's metaphor, or Aldo Leopold's um, poetic um, poetic um, protocol. But I think we can understand a lot if we go into this deeply. Yeah, and I mean wow. just 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 because we're talking about theater, um, why not using taking this just this prompt you know for for an for an um, for a production say okay we'll do this but we'll we we'll do this as thinking like a mountain or maybe thinking like um thinking maybe it's something which is closer to the theater thinking like um think like skin like the like human skin you know how how much thought processes on 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 my skin like how many beings how many how many how, how much breath and you know, I think 
we think if there if there are persons with artistic imagination around you just need to give this prompt and then they will start to 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 imagine and like okay wow so now we are actually skin and let's let's behave like skin and i mean this is so beautiful in theater you can just you can just do this in a little improvisation session you know that and you just do it and then you see what what comes from this Okay, that was that was my little comment. No, it's a fantastic uh, uh, prompt skin or the idea do do when you approach theater, think think of it like of a, you are a mountain and you do theater. What what would change and not as the inner world of a human? You know what does it mean? Yeah. And to be part yeah. already of nature, you are part of it. You know, part of the mountain when you go and direct work on stage or act in it. And um, but you have a different experience of the po this poetic of diversity you quote uh, you quote Clisson you know and the, this kind of yeah. coordination that that we you know have to perhaps have that uh, consciousness of the mountain and not the consciousness of the climber who wants to have the success or victory as you say yeah, 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 forget yeah, about yeah, victories yes. be like a dog you say and uh, and I like that and um but um, I encourage everyone, you know, to tell us the, 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 when is your book? Is it out in English and since when and um, where can we buy it? Um, uh, okay, the book you, 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 yeah. you, you refer to, that's, that's Enlivenment, right? And yeah, Enlivenment. enlivenment. Mm -hmm. how, how, what is the subtitle Poetics for the Anthropocene, maybe? Or yeah, something? Poetics for the Anthropocene. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, um, it's M MIT Press. MIT Press. And um, it's, um, it, it's, it, came out in 2019 so it starts to be a little bit aged i need to i need to write more i need to publish right. more well it takes it takes things and maybe also the corona yeah. the time of corona to really um think that uh, through and take that in as a serious thing as a last question what are you working on now then you said you are you're working on a new book uh and what's what's oh yeah yeah, yeah. So, so this this idea that there needs to be a next book is also a very practical idea. So I'm 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 working on a lot of things. So so it, and probably I need to mention that I I it's already published, but it's published by by Bell Foundation again. I'm I'm I've, I've written on on ecopolitics of um, animism. So I've, I've really written on on what 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 does animism into our to a worldview so that um, that that it is very much more about sharing so this is this is findable and uh, but i'm also what i'm also doing is um, exploring this this the sharing on this in, inner plane which is not visible at all so somehow going into this inner dimension of what does it mean to be alive on the inside and and how how can i explore this because also so that is that is one one other book which is um, which will um, come out in in uh, German language first in this year I hope, um, and um, because in this time of of, of the great vanishing, the, the sixth extinction we also call it we we have we see so many beings vanish. So it's I think it is important to. To somehow develop a talent to 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 be close to this experience of aliveness, really from an experiential standpoint. So you could also say it's it's a little bit mystic what I'm doing there, um, and um, and it's interesting that I meet so many people, colleagues, and um, um, people from related fields who really, as if somebody had called them artists, lots of artists, really start to explore this. It's absolutely incredible. And mm -hmm. um, there's even a botanist, Monica Galliano, who who um, is one of the one of those who who were instrumental in um, in let's say rediscovering the, the the idea that plants are sentient and plants communicate. And she she talks to plants, or plants talk to her. I mean, she's a botanist with a position. So you see, yeah. these are practices which are somehow animistic and which are somehow I think which are really needed and which then. Um, are always very, very close to artistical perception and poetic perception, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, true. that's what I'm what I'm exploring. What I'm exploring, yeah. and, the, yeah. and also the work of uh, Julia Strauss, who is kind of a Siberian uh, indigenous yeah, a, uh, uh, artist, but also a student yes. of uh, Kittler. And actually, she says she yeah. invites you to come to Essence, and I should come too, I'm... and to her academia. <laughs> so there is something there. It is very serious, and to all our listeners, this. Yeah great change the change of paradigma has happened already it's no longer up for discussion like when galileo said we yes. 
turn around the yeah. sun. We now enter the new age. Theater has to react. If it's part of mm. life, reacts, reenacts life and is life itself to be alive in it. You know, we have to find a way to think like the mountain or the skin in a new way, away from the, the mountain climber, but to think, and I like that image, to think like the mountain and that we have to experiment uh, in the true sense. You know, how do we do that? How yeah. do we connect? And the idea of the commons, I like that very much. The public spaces, the sharing. And listen, you gave us a great gift and it was for free today. So, uh, so you're right. Maybe this was a great part um, of nature. It was great uh, talking to you. Thanks to our audience for listening in. I know how much is out there, but we have great writers, great thinkers like uh, Andreas, but we also need good audience. And actually he's talking directly to you for your life. And it's not just about there, but also... For you how do you experience life how are you really alive how alive are you the old question that zen buddhists and monks and artists explored over centuries and i think there is a new awareness of it and we need to be part of life in order because life is what creates life in the future generations so we have to really honor that and we forgot as thomas pounded out in the last 300 years of enlightenment a lot has been lost and we need an in life Enlightenment point two, enlightenment, enlightenment point two, an upgrade. And I hope we made a small contribution today. Thank you so much. Thanks for Hal Round to host us, VJ and uh, Thea, Talia at the Siegel Center. And I hope you will join our upcoming programs and we will continue these uh, whole earth talks. It was really enlightening in a good sense, enlivening, if I, that is the right word uh, to talk to you. And um, we, so we, thank we just, you. We just introduce it now into the discourse yeah lovely thank you so thank much you. thank Great. you so much thank you bye bye